the future is remote. It's in the office. It's hybrid. How to set yourself and your team up for success and well-being in the future. A conversation with two amazing guests coming right up. I'm Daryl Black, and if we haven't met before, I take my 30 plus years of experience in crisis leadership and corporate management, and I know that there's a very clear path to move from well-meaning, well-intentioned manager to transformational and effective leader. And it's the lessons I've learned in the environments like Katrina and Canada's two largest disasters and the corporate boardroom that I'm taking to you so you can be a better leader starting today with minimal viable effort. I want to take this opportunity to welcome two guests to the episode today. We have a couple of folks that will really help leaders and leaders of leaders and CEOs and corporate managers navigate the complexities that is the future of our workplaces. And that's around, is it in the office? Is it completely remote? Is it a hybrid? What do the fellow leaders need to worry about on a personal level? And and I think that a lot of what we, we have seen over the past 19, 20 months or whatever the case is, we've seen huge seismic shifts in how we do business and how we work and and how we relate to one another. But even on the the individual leadership side, I really want to talk from a a personal perspective, the impact that the last 19, 20 months has had on, on leaders. And so I'll throw it over to our two guests to do an introduction. So Cheryl, I'll start with yourself and then we'll go over to Tim and and just a, a brief background in terms of who you are, what brought you here. And I will also tell everyone that at the end of this, there's a really unique opportunity that is a way of giving back to the community. And we'll be talking about that, but also I'll be asking our two guests, what is the one question that no one asks around the virtual workplace that they wish people did ask? So Cheryl, over to you. Well, thank you. I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation. So my name is Cheryl Watson. And my background really has been in technology companies for years. I spent 15 years working for global Fortune 500 company Intuit, and then really focused on how I could get back to my city. And I I really focus on helping to spur our technology and innovation economy. And I founded an organization called Innovate Edmonton, which is now our city's newest economic development agency really focused on creating the right environment for tech-enabled startup companies. And then I spent the last year and a half uh, campaigning to be our city's next mayor. Now, I was not successful, but through that experience, met this amazing man, Tim Carwell, and have spent the last few weeks really exploring a new initiative that we're really excited about, and I know we're going to talk about later. Well, that is fantastic. So a really good background. And, and I know Intuit has always been forward leaning in terms of culture and all of those other things. And uh, I'm really anxious to dive into what you've learned there and, and also moving forward. And thank you for your attempt to become our next mayor. That is a, a noble pursuit in itself. So thank you for that. Speaking of amazing gentlemen, well, we don't have any other amazing gentlemen. So Tim, over <laughs> to you. <laughs> I'm an entrepreneur and, and investor. And uh, a really good friend of mine that's part of the panel actually said that I'm also a goodwill ambassador, which I, I have so much respect for the person that said that, that I'm going to just start to use that. I've uh, been uh, an entrepreneur for over 20 years. I've been involved with a, well, a couple of successful exits and, uh, and more than a couple acquisitions. So I've been uh, keeping myself busy and, and I've got, uh, I've got three kids a grandson and an absolutely amazing wife that is the most patient person on the planet. I'm excited to to talk to you. We, we talk all the time, so it's it's going to be nice to to share some ideas and thoughts around this really challenging time. And if anyone wants to see Tim's uh, grandson, go to Instagram and uh, <laughs> you'll see more than enough hair. <laughs> so... Uh, Tim, let's start with you. And, and I know in, in talking over the course of this pandemic and before, but you were what would be called an early adopter, essentially. So, you know, this is not necessarily a pandemic episode, but certainly uh, you were one that identified the trigger pretty early with your company, Calm Alert. So can you just talk about what went into the decision first and foremost to go virtual? Because it's a pretty bold step. And what were some of your fears and, and barriers around that that maybe 
prevented you from doing that or, or was even just things that you had to worry about from a corporate perspective? About five years ago, we had to worry about it um, because we didn't really have a disaster recovery plan. We didn't have a, a business continuity plan. And, and if you're going to be in emergency communications, you probably want to do that. The decision to move, uh, there was one single fear, and that was, will our culture remain the same? We flicked the switch, and we were all working from home late January when uh, Bill Gates said, this might be it. We thought, well, let's let's try and let's see what it's it's like. So there wasn't really a lot of uh, trepidation other than the culture piece. And I, I think we'll dive into the culture piece. And over to you, Cheryl, from your own experience in, in, in all of the other companies and organizations that you've interacted with early on, what were, what were some of the fears and the barriers to them to, to going? Because I think some like Tim pulled the trigger really quickly and very definitively others, maybe not so much. So what was your experience early on in the pandemic with regard to that shift from the office to maybe virtual and so on? Well, I, I have two experiences really of working remotely, and the first was at Intuit, and I was part of a small group that was mandated really with helping Intuit to become a global organization. And what that really means is how do you create teams in other countries, geographies that have very different cultures and environments that you're used to? And, and to Tim's point, culture really was always the number one thing on our mind. Intuit had a very strong culture. And so how do you create teams in other cities that have never really experienced or felt the culture? And so how do you build that um, with teams that you're working with virtually? And then flash forward to building a campaign team in a pandemic, people that had never met each other before and that were committed to this common vision, yet had no relationships, had not built trust, really didn't have common values or culture that Tim had spent so many years with his company building. How do you create that from scratch in a virtual environment? And it's very, very different to start from a strong culture and then expand it versus starting from nothing. So two very, very different experiences that I've had. And, and so very interesting to compare and contrast them about um, how you build culture from established culture or how do you expand culture versus creating it from nothing. I would, I would agree with that. And it's been interesting because there are teams that have now been formed that have literally never met before, you know, because this is, this wasn't something that was just one month or two months. We are now at the time of the recording, we're, you know, a year, almost two years into this thing. And it's important to recognize again, while it's not pandemic focused, these are challenges that you'll face and, and uh, have faced throughout, but that issue around culture and this notion of personal connection and all these other things. And, and so we're going to dive into culture here shortly, but I want to talk a little bit about, uh, Tim, from your perspective. So you pulled the, the, the trigger, you went remote. That was the plan. What actually ended up happening with regard to culture, with regard to how you were able to manage people and performance manage the, the reality is as much as we would love to be kumbaya, you know, as much as we'd love to be people focused at the end of the day, as leaders. As CEOs and entrepreneurs and, and corporate managers, we are accountable. We're accountable to shareholders. We're accountable to our own families and all of those other things. So there is a balance that has to be reached. And so Tim, what actually happened over the, you know, walk us through the, the actual events that occurred once you did decide to go remote, because it's one thing to talk about it and think about it. What actually happened in terms of ground truth? We had a lot of confidence simply because um, we're a transactional business. When the phone rings, we answer it. When somebody asks us to do something, we do it. So it, it's, it was pretty easy from, from that perspective. We actually just flicked the switch and started working. And then about a month and a half, two months in, we, we started to over communicate. Um, and so we've been kind of like course correcting along the way. I think I use the word, uh, love you guys tons and hope everybody's safe and we built the special teams for check-ins and we really tried to focus uh, as much as we could on on people's mental well-being 
not because we're anybody here's Kreskin or anything like that. It's just that, that we felt that we wanted to take care of one another. So that's what we did. I will say that th th as the, kind of to Cheryl's point, it's not a one size fits all solution. If you've got a good, good, strong cu culture, you're way ahead of the game because people will listen. And when you choose to be vulnerable and check in, it's, it's actually believable rather than ticking the box. Um, the challenge now is, is that we're going crazy sitting in our homes, working and, and, you know, taking care of our cats and our dogs and our families. And, and we want to get back to normal. So we're, we're trying something different. We're going to try hoteling when it becomes comfortable for everybody. And we're going to visit all sorts of parts of Canada for sure. And you know, what a gift we're, we don't have office space anymore. So let's, uh, let's, let's spoil our employees rotten and take them places and not one of those traditional things, but you know, go and hang out with your family and, and, and enjoy it. We're going to, we're going to try, uh, we're going to try that. We're also looking at, um, actually acquiring, um, a home in the mountains that we're going to leave empty and anybody, uh, that works for Kamler will, uh, can use it whenever they want. And, and uh, all they got to do is pay for their groceries, but they get a place to stay and hang out. And if they want to go on a hike with me, I'll um, be happy to do that or mountain bike or ski or whatever. So th that's sort of where we're, we're testing the waters. Am I nervous about it? Yeah. A little bit. I, I don't know how that's going to, going to work. We've never tried it before. Um, logistically getting everybody to a conference. Hope we don't have to hire an event planner or something like that. But uh, yeah, so that's that's sort of where we're uh, where we're at where we're going. And what are you thinking that the hoteling will do versus uh, you know keeping them you know safe and secure in their in their blankets along with their COVID pet? That's a whole different issue. There are many <laughs> pets, Tim. You and I have talked about many pets will have attachment issues because of COVID. Totally get it. So why why did you decide on hoteling versus what you've been up to for the last little while? Not to toot Cheryl's horn, but Cheryl, when we were doing a couple of interviews and she talked about the, the magic of being in a room together and, and creating that connection that's, you can't do over, over this, um, medium. So that's, that's actually why we, we decided we would do that. And I do miss, like, there's lots of people that I used to hang out with and, uh, I'm not sure they missed me, but I should miss that. But, so we're, that's, that's probably the reason is, is because of, uh, some of the comments that Cheryl made about, uh, you know, if you're going to kick ass and, and conquer the world, it's always good to give a high five and not a virtual one. So that's why. Yeah. Thank you. And Cheryl, we should probably back up a bit in your experience. What is culture? And, and I think that it's a term that gets thrown around all the time. Oh, our culture, our corporate culture, but. A lot of times in my own experience, we haven't really defined what that looks like. And you use words like values and, and what does right look like for us? So from your perspective, what does culture look like and how do, how do companies and organizations set themselves up for future, whether that be hoteling or whatever that looks like? So what is culture and, and how are we going to be able to maintain it moving forward? I'm sure that there are many more smart smarter people than I am that have formally defined culture. But for me, it's about beliefs and behaviors. And so I think that that's why many organizations set values, because that says this is what we commonly believe is important to us. And then sometimes you even talk about ethos. Like I've, I've built ethos statements with teams about this is how we feel. This is how we're going to behave in certain situations. And I think that those kind of conversations, while they can be held virtually, I think that there's something in demonstrating what your values look like or demonstrating behaviors. And to your point about saying what's, what's right or how do we behave, I think is something that organizations, you really need to establish that from the very beginning. So when we formed our campaign team, while we were very clear of what the vision was for the campaign was to build a city that works, how were we going to work together collectively um, to, move, to move toward that vision? And so we set up value statements about what would be important to us, authenticity. We talked about integrity. We talked about the collective good. And then we, we talked about behaviors. And so we talked about what it meant to always be a team. Or what did trust look like 
in within this team that really um, came together, not because we shared a paycheck or, or received a paycheck. This was all volunteer. And so this commitment to how we would behave, how we would demonstrate our values was very important. But you can only, while while virtual and all of these amazing platforms are very liberating, they're also constraining. And so we all have been in in meetings where we think I probably would have said more on that topic, but I'm I'm very conscious of the time frame of the conversation and very conscious about not dominating the conversation. And so you hold back a little bit. And so I, I really respect him, your concept about hoteling or coming together. I think that that's so important that you remove the constraints of time, um, that you give space for conversations that come up organically in hallways, maybe with different people. And so I, I'm really excited to see how this plays out for you because um, I do believe that while we can operate in this virtual environment, there is time and a need for space for people to come together. It's interesting because as much as we disliked meetings before, they did have that tertiary advantage of if you arrive a minute or two early, it's, hey, good morning, Cheryl. How was your weekend? Oh, it was great. I did this. I did that. Hey, Tim, anything going on for you coming up? Oh, yeah, I was really busy. New grandson, check out my Instagram. Here's all my pictures, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. And I think that one thing that the virtual world has, has the, the burden of the online world is we have an incredible ability to pack in way more meetings way more time constraints with zero personal contact or personal context for any of this. And it's literally hop on, do your meeting, end it, go on to the next one. And, and Cheryl, I think you said it, it was kind of all business. So mm -hmm. what I'm hearing so far is that both of you are, are in agreement that the future is, or should be for lack of a better word, hybrid. And that is while respecting the remoteness of workers because there's no commute there's also you know it's safer all of those other things i think i'm hearing both of you say that while there are some huge advantages to that certainly don't forget the value of that personal face-to-face -face connection and just my own story around it i've been involved in a, a large-scale project here in, in canada and um it's been 10 months i just met my boss last week like literally face to face, we went for lunch and I had never met her. I have talked to her on Zoom a zillion times. And even with all of that kind of virtual contact, man, it was sure good to just be in somebody's energy, mm -hmm. you know, like just to have a chat and chat about daughters, chat about dogs like Samuel and, you know, she's a Garmin rep and all of the things that I actually didn't really know ahead of time. And I, and Heck, uh, we've spent hours on Zoom together. So that's a really important point, and I'm glad you brought that up. But now let's shift gears a little bit because culture is about our relationship as a team and our, our relationship maybe with our customers and all of those other things. But rarely, I think, do we speak as leaders and, and not that we're martyrs or anything like that, but I think there's often a perspective that we're, we're of service and we have to make sure everyone else is okay before we even think about ourselves, right? And I, the pandemic certainly made a lot of us focus outwards on making sure our company was okay and everything like that. And Tim, what were some things that you experienced personally, whether it be on, on your own leadership side, maybe it was uh, more confidence, not confidence, you know, the feeling of isolation, all of those other things. So can you speak to what your relationship with yourself has been over the last little while and what you're going to be doing to to prepare yourself for your own well-being moving forward? Well, not that I've ever talked to anybody about this, but the pandemic's actually been a huge change for me. I started um, looking within. Um, I started to meditate uh, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And um, uh, I, I haven't really missed uh, in the last year a day. I do it every morning. I also decided that I wanted to um, really focus on my um, my mental, physical well-being. I've lost 75 pounds in the last year and a half. Um, and I didn't do it 
for any other reason that I wanted to be an example. I, I don't talk about it with anybody. Um, but I try to be caring. I try to, I try to take care of my, my, myself by feeding myself properly. And, and I never miss an opportunity to tell somebody I love them. Um, I, I've become a, a much different person and I'm really kind of comfortable in my own skin right now. So, so I guess, um, uh, well, you said I'm, I'm not allowed to swear, but like, I really don't give a shit what anybody thinks about me. I am very, very interested in pushing out positive energy to, to the world to a point where I've been accused of, of, what do they call it? Toxic positivity. I don't even know what the hell that means, but, but, uh, to me, it's just, it's super, super important that if I can catch somebody on social media or in a conversation and, and, and I say something uplifting or positive and it reaches them, then perfect. That, that, so that's, that's really what, what's happened with, with me. The benefit is people that I work with when I am having a bad day, because everybody has bad days, overwhelmed and, uh, they're checking in with me, Holly and, and, uh, and I could go on and on and on about, you know, just checking in to see if you're okay. Seemed a little bit off on that call or whatever. And it's like, holy crap. Like I got some pretty awesome people in my life that I work with and that I live with. So, so yeah, I, I turned inward and I, I didn't look at the world around me to, to try to change it. I tried to change myself, um, in a positive way. Well, and it's really tough to tell others to take care of themselves and look after themselves and their family when meanwhile, you know, you're sitting there on zoom calls, eating a bag of chips and you know, in your sweats and tank top and that's that. Right. So yeah, really, really good point. What about you, Cheryl? What, what has it been like for you and, and even running a campaign through all of this and, and just the amount of time and the energy and the, and the personal, uh, you know, currency that you've been putting into everything that you're doing, because I think you're a very passionate leader and you, you are, which is good and it's bad because you don't leave anything on the table, right? So what does that look like over the last little while? And, and what does it look like in the future to make sure that you're continuing to pro perform at a high level and engage rather than disengage from a leadership perspective? Well, here's the word that came to mind when Tim was talking, and I think is really important for all of us as leaders is the need to be deliberate. And I think that pre COVID pre pandemic, there were a lot of things that happened organically. And so we didn't have to quite be as structured or put in place frameworks. And I think that it's so important for us to do that, to recognize that as leaders, the environment has changed. And so how are we going to take a pause and determine number one, what we need to do as leaders ourselves to make sure that we are operating effectively when the game has changed. We have to think about our employees in different ways. And I think that, you know, my hindsight on the campaign is that I got caught up at times and wasn't as deliberate as I needed to be recognizing that I had this virtual team, recognizing that it was my energy that they were all feeling. And sometimes it's easy for us when we're so busy and so um, at times even overwhelmed to, to not be deliberate. And that can cause chaos because you recognize that if you don't have these frameworks in place, um, your behaviors have the ability to impact your broader team. And so, you know, I myself as well doing, being deliberate again to say, what does post campaign look like for me? How do I make sure that I'm healthy? Um, that I have good mental health, that I am able to then in whatever I do next, bring my best self and be thoughtful about how my actions um, have such an impact on others um, and how I need to show up differently in this virtual environment. How do I need to make sure that I am checking all of the relationships? Tim, I loved where you told stories. Your team is constantly thinking about each other. But if you're not deliberate about doing that and demonstrating that that's important um, or putting in place practices so that you make sure that you connect with everyone, it's not going to happen. So I'll circle back and say being deliberate, I think, is so important as leaders recognizing that the environment has changed. 
a lot of folks that follow know that I have a, a phrase, leaders eat last, but they always go first. And what that means is you always put your team ahead, but you have to be as a leader intentional. So if you want a vulnerable team, you have to be vulnerable first. If you want trust, and you've mentioned that a few times, Cheryl, if you want trust, you have to trust first. If you want a respectful workplace, you have to be respectful. And that starts with being deliberate and intentional and mm -hmm. what is the intention. And so that's a good segue into expectations, because I think that as leaders, when you're face to face, a lot of things just become inherent just by osmosis and all of those other things. But I think expectations, and I'm curious to hear, we'll start with Tim and then over to Cheryl again. I'm curious to hear what role expectations have had if you've had, if you found yourself being far more specific with expectations or you know, what does that look like? Because again, honestly, my own opinion is if they were unproductive in the office, they're not going to necessarily magically be more productive out of the office, right? It, so I, I want to be very, very pragmatic with this. There are individuals that working from home would be a disaster. Others that need to go into the office and need that structure and all of those other things. So what role, if any, Tim, have expectations played from, from your perspective in the virtual world? Well, um, to stick on that same thing, thing that we were just talking about a little, I, I own the experience and I react to the experience. Um, I just wrote down while you were talking, I don't own a person's spirit. So they may have other things going on. I just accept them for who they are and what they do. And if they've got a particular, especially in our business, um, if they've got a particular skill set where they're magic when they need to be magic, and then you have to kind of, you know, deal with the 10% of the time, I'm not talking about those quadrant employees that are, are really good, but a cancer. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. I fire those people so fast and make your head spin. But the, the ones that, that, um, I have a lot of, I have a lot of patience for those people. And I, I try to internalize it and, and figure out different ways of, of reaching somebody. If you're not committed to your teammates, then you're not going to be a commoner. They just, you're just not. So we, we don't really even need to police it. it. They just, they just don't stick around. Um, because there's an expectation that we have of, of each other. It's not something that I created. It's not something that I manage. I just do what I do and, and try to be as uplifting as possible and apologize when I'm being a jerk face. And I do that fairly often because I am a passionate guy. And sometimes I always, I, the comment I always make is never, ever mistake my passion for anger. I am a very passionate guy. My voice gets loud. I, I'm a cheerleader in some situations, but don't ever think that I'm attacking, you know, the, an individual personally. Uh, I just don't, I don't own a spirit. I can, I can inspire, but sometimes people can't take it in and that's on them. That's not on me. I think the, the word that has been making its way around and rightfully so is empathy. That's really a word that, that is encapsulating what you're talking about is being empathetic. So empathy and sympathy are different, but empathy is at least understanding and holding space for that person, wherever they might be and, and recognizing where they've been in, where they're from and what challenges they're having. And so I think that that's a, a critical part of what you just talked about there, because we don't know what's going on behind closed doors. You know, we don't know about the three screaming kids because they're homeschooling now or whatever that looks like. And I think that we have to create that safety, that safe place. And if, if we have employees coming to a meeting uh, with a pit in their stomach, uh, that's probably not, not the right thing. So Cheryl, how about over to you from, from that perspective? When you, I, you, you asked the question around expectations, and I think that Tim answered it earlier on when he talked about how he is over communicating. And that is so important in this environment because oftentimes when we were all in traditional offices, um, expectations could almost be defined um, subconsciously or unconsciously um, through actions and so observable expectations. And I'll use one example, even of work hours, right? So you would set your expectations around work hours through your own behaviors. What time would you come into the office? What time would you leave? Would you get to meetings on time? Would you leave meetings early? 
how you really managed your time was observable. Now we're in this virtual environment and I think back to my Intuit days where, you know, I led teams in seven countries and double that many time zones. Now, how do you set your expectations around um, work hours within that 24 hour clock, if you will? And so uh, we were constantly communicating the framework of what it meant to lead a global team. And so we went so far as actually creating a schedule that said, you need to remember that a, you know, a Friday night in North America is actually a Saturday somewhere else around the world. And so we set times where people could book meetings or what was appropriate time to kind of send emails or to set deadlines. And so we had to over communicate using frameworks um, and thinking about putting in place how do you bring the whole team together so that you can have these conversations? And so communicate, 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 I think is really the answer around how do you set expectations and you can't over communicate now. I love that. I absolutely love that. And a phrase I use all the time is communicate relentlessly because even the, the, the term over communicate has a negative connotation, mm -hmm. but to me, communicate relentlessly. And then it's ultimately up to you to decide whether that communication is pertinent to you, but it's, it's not necessarily up to me to determine how important it is to you and those sorts of things. And you spoke about it and it's, that's around boundaries. And I know that for me, you know, with different time zones and all of that, there is, it's could easy you, for me to wake you up. explain what boundaries are? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's yeah. why I have you guys on here. Like, no, this is not how this works. <laughs> so, Sorry, I didn't mean to. You know, I, I love it because because we, we've we seen a, a, a dissolving of those boundaries, I think. And when you talk about expectations, Cheryl, and all of those, and, and what right looks like is, is for us as leaders, our fellow leaders, we set the boundaries. We demonstrate what right looks like. And, but for me, it's really, really, it has been difficult because running a national project and we're, you know, three hours and four hours difference and all the rest. It's easy for me to go wake up at 6 a.m., grab some coffee, hop on a Zoom call because it it's easy to do. I don't have to go into the office versus if we had office hours like 8 to 4.30, everybody would know 8 o'clock Mountain Standard Time, Daryl gets into the office and don't do anything or talk to him until then. But we've We've seen that, and this is going back to the leadership part, because as a leader, I felt compelled to do that because I'm the leader. I'm the one that is supposed to be looking after this stuff. And so it wasn't even about what right looks like. It was about like, well, shit, if I don't do it, no one else is going to do it. And so I want to loop back to the personal part, because when you talk about expectations, we have to be intentional with our own boundaries. Otherwise, it reaches the point where we're burned out. We're not being effective. And those sorts of things. So I'm, I'm really glad that, that we talked about that because we always are thinking outwards, you know, setting boundaries with the team. But what does that look like for us? And, and that, that obligation that we feel to attend that 6 o'clock a.m. meeting because it's easy. I just grab a coffee, throw a shirt on, a reasonably clean shirt. And heck, sometimes on Zoom, I don't even have to have my camera on. So that's good. But I would start at 6 a.m. But then in B.C. is an hour behind me. So I, I could go till eight or 10 o'clock that night, just on Zoom calls and not think twice. So we've talked about communication. We've talked about, it looks like the future is probably a hybrid and it, if possible anyways, where the remote environment is really, really good, but there needs to be that connection and that energy and that, that sharing of experiences and, and all of those tertiary kind of conversations that happen around it to, to create that connection. We've talked about needing to be deliberate and intentional and setting schedules and expectations and all of those other things. And so if we were to look at the future, so I'll start with you, Cheryl, what does the future look like when you look back at the last, you know, year and a half or whatever, what is the advice or in terms of the lessons that you've learned that you want to really either really lean into moving forward and you would ask or hope others would, and maybe some other things that you maybe take the, you know, take the, the, the gas pedal off a little bit, just with your experience now. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that 
um, or what I what I dream of is that as we all think about what the future looks like and the future of work and the future of our teams and our organizations, that we're doing it collectively and that it is a collective conversation. And Tim Tim has done this well. So he talked about how his team made the decision not to go back to the office. I think that organizations still benefit from having in-person time together. And so how does an organization now collectively map forward their future of um, a hybrid work environment or a non-hybrid work environment, but that they do so together where it's maybe not a, you know, a vote where everyone says we're going to vote and decide that we're all not going to, you know, the majority is going to win but more so unpacking why it will be important to come together again and to have physical presence with each other so that people understand the why of it versus just a directive. Okay, so now it's safe for all of us to go back again. We're going to go back to the way we used to do it. Um, but it's a conversation about what the benefits are um, or you know what, what has not worked well. And so that it's a conversation where people really understand and then embrace it because we all want to be a part of the why or the the future what and so being able to have a voice i think is really important um so that there's more buy-in so that people really look positively on this next um state of work because many many employees as we know would love to just stay home it, it is much easier it allows for a better balance at times um you know it's easier often and so how do you convince or how do you have um, your full employee base embrace going back to work has to be um, a collaborative conversation. Uh, a saying I use often is involvement equals commitment. Mm. So, you know, it's important even for me to have a say. And at the end of the day, I know in an organization, I win some, I lose some, but being engaged in that conversation and really important point around the why, uh, whereas a lot of times we're, we're excellent at what? We are fantastic at telling people what, what does that why look like? That's often what we're, what we're missing around that. So I really like that. Thank you. Hey, Daryl, it sounds, it sounds uh, like I need to start following you more. You, um, have a lot of interesting beliefs and opinions. Have, and I, yeah. So I'm gonna have to check you out on your social platforms. Okay. Well, all right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that. And feel free to unfollow as soon as you follow, right? Like, no, no I, I don't know. It's going to be you. Like, you're not going to get a message. Hey, Cheryl, I'm glad you followed. And then half up, wait, Cheryl, where'd you go? What happened? <laughs> um, so, Tim, how about over to you looking back? You, what are you going to really lean into in the, uh, well, because we're not perfect. We've made mistakes over the last 20 months and so on, and we'll continue to. So what are you going to lean into, Tim, moving forward? Was again, I keep, uh, I keep writing things down as we're talking, this is a conversation. Um, so my, my business mentor, Pat, I uh, just last week or the week before, um, sent me a text as I was, we were talking about something and he, he just said to thine own self, be true. And, and so, um, I think I'm just going to embrace those, those moments of, um, uh, intimacy that, that you have it at work. Um, I like the idea of honesty. And one thing that pops into my mind is, um, I, I actually got, I was fortunate enough to work down, down South in Boston many years ago. Um, that was cool, but I was there in the middle of the big dig for, for those of you that don't know, the big dig was they took F, all the highways that were above ground and put them underground. So the first thing that my, my employer asked was, are you a morning person or are you an evening person? So I think we're going to keep doing the, having those conversations and figure out what people, um, uh, really want to do. I also am a firm believer going forward that this, I get in early. I was told that when I was a young guy, got to get in early, got to be the first one in. And then even if you're dead tired, pretend like you're working really hard and like all that's garbage. Um, I'm, I believe that everybody's way more effective if they, they focus, uh, their life on their life and, and not on their work. That is not who a person is. You can be so effective in a short period of time. If you've got the, 
proper sleep, proper diet. Um, I want to say meditate, um, again, but you know, take care, taking care of yourself. So I, I like I said, I think, um, we're going to, it's going to be weird. Like maybe we'll have, you know, 50 people that are going to want to be in an office. The other 50 are going to be working from home. I'm not sure that's going to work, but, um, yeah, we'll just sort of see how things go. Hoteling first and then course correct. Hey, that that's fantastic. And you know, I think the three of us, I don't want to be ageist by any stretch, but I think I can speak for all three of us when I say that those paradigms around you will get respect because you're the leader. You can demand it because you're the leader. Uh, the job comes first. And if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. And I'm never going to ask you how you feel about something because it's irrelevant. I've just told you what you need to do. All those other things. Tim, I'm really glad that you, you, you brought that up because leadership 2.0 is a much more personal and person centric kind of connection that we should be making with, with, uh, with our folks that, that we support. And I even say too, in operations and, and teams I belong to, it's not a chain of command. It's a chain of support. I am literally here to support the organization and sure on the org chart, I'm at the top, but it's really a, a network. Uh, of human beings. And we have to remember that any endeavor, whether it be business or, or anything is really about, about the people, about our folks. And, and Tim, I'm really glad that you, you spoke about that, but at the heart of that is us as leaders, right? If, if we're not taking care of ourselves, if we're not creating boundaries and all those other things, I think, uh, then we're, we're actually setting everyone else up for failure as well. Um, uh, so Tim, I'm going to go to you and then Cheryl over to you. What, in all of this stuff around virtual management, and then we'll talk about this, this incredible project that you have uh, coming up here. In all of the, the uncertainty and all of those other things and, and conversations that you've had, what, what is a question that nobody asks that you wish they would? And what is the answer to that? What is the one question that nobody ever asks around this, but you wish they would? Now, I, I will say, I will say in full transparency, we covered a lot of ground. So how about this? In the interest of creating psychological safety myself and, you know, showing what right looks like, you two are okay. You don't have to answer. Heaven forbid, I don't want to make you uncomfortable. All those other things. <laughs> but let's talk about the future. Tim, Cheryl, who wants to talk about the Goodwill Project? Because this is awesome. And this is innovative, and this is something uh, I think that uh, that a lot of people can learn from with regard to what right looks like. So, Tim or Cheryl, you want to talk about the Goodwill Project? Well, this is Tim's project, so he should he should start. It was Tim's idea, and and then Tim told this idea to a couple of well, six fantastic leaders that went, "What? You're going to give away your office fully furnished?" internet ready to go? Why? Well, we don't need it. And it's going to help another business um, and could be rocket fuel for them. And without question, every single panelist, and I'll explain that in a bit, was like, yeah, I'm in. Um, so essentially what, what we're doing, we're calling it the Goodwill Project, is we want to know an Edmonton-based business or Metro Edmonton-based business, um, what their business is about how it's going to change the world and how their diversity um, of staff is going to make that a reality. I, I said that for a very specific reason. Um, I was challenged by, by my chief, Gary Kipling, to, to do more and be vis visible. Daryl, you know, we've known each other forever, never talked about those types of things. But when your chief says, hey, you need to do more, you, you do more. So, um, so that's, uh, that's uh, basically where the idea uh, came up. We want to see something positive in the media, something positive on, on social. And we really do want to see, um, somebody, I, I feel like I've bought a lottery ticket. I'm like so stupid excited about this. Cause I want to know who wins. I am not, um, involved in the, in the selection. Um, it, the team is going to select and they're doing a live pitch, um, in front of these six panelists and a cross section of, of, um, of really dynamic folks. So I'm pretty excited to, uh, to, uh, see what happens. 
So I'll give so it. So it's a couple years of of uh, rent in a downtown building that yep. previously was occupied by Com Alert. Processes they they bid and that closes this week at the time of recording. So there will be information in the description here that uh, upon publishing. And you mentioned panelists and the pitch. And speaking of which, Cheryl, that's probably a great segue over to you. You're one yeah. of six that were were selected, which is like super exciting. So talk about the Goodwill Project from your perspective. Well, and we have the hardest job. So Tim um, has been an incredible uh, benefactor of this idea and the initiative, obviously donating his office space. And he has then asked the six of us, and so there's six other, uh, five other women and I, who will be tasked with this very, very challenging job to pick one company. We've all heard all of the stories about how many amazing startups there are in our city. And so we have, I'm, I don't even know any, how many applications, probably nearly a hundred applicants that have applied for this incredible gift. And so we have to narrow it down and pick just one. So the process is December 10th, the application process closes. Uh, we'll spend about four or five days then narrowing it down. And, and we thought we might narrow it down to about five or six. And so we would then let those five or six companies know that they have been shortlisted. Then some of the, the um, community members, not the judges, but community members will actually engage with this shortlist group of companies to help them with their pitch. How do they present and truly compete um, for this incredible space. And so they'll get some assistance with their pitch. And then January 4th, we will be actually in the office together with these finalist companies. They will come in one at a time. They will get 10 minutes to pitch to the judges. And then that very day, we need to select one winning company so that they can have access to the space right in that first week of January. So then they'll have two years in this space to do some of the work that Tim's team did, setting culture. How do you uh, really benefit from a small and mighty team that plays more than one role? And so how is the space going to be an enabler or an accelerator for them um, in their early stages of growth? Okay, Tim, I see why you brought Cheryl on board. Probably right? a good idea there. Very <laughs> articulate. I like it. <laughs> and, and just so we're clear, this is not... Um, this is not with all due respect to warehouses and corners of warehouses, but this isn't an area that Comalert just cleared a corner for of pallets and swept and said, Hey, here's an internet cable and, uh, you know, have fun I, for two years. This is a state of the art. Yeah. Space. Yeah. I was, I was heavily involved in the, in the design. It's all glass. There's, um, uh, you know, upgraded furniture all over the place. There's a, a pretty, pretty cool central kitchen. There's a sitting area for people to come and hang, uh, go and hang out. There's a, there's the operation center that can be closed off, quiet. We did have plans to build a podcast studio there um, before all of this happened. And as much as uh, I haven't pitched this to Tim and I, I already know the answer, which is why I didn't pitch it, but you know, one of your boardrooms should be accessible to me 24 seven. <laughs> so I don't, but again, I kind of get the idea. I already know what the answer might be. Uh, it's like Columbo, never ask a question that you don't know the answer to. So I think we'll just, we'll just leave that for now. Yeah. But everything <laughs> but the boardroom. Yeah. Okay. yeah and and I, I do, just so you know, it's on 101st and Jasper. Um, you can, from the boardroom, actually from, from the boardroom or the operations center, you can see the, the arena. Uh, the financial district is right there. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's pretty, it's a pretty decent space. I do know that, um, you know, you don't have to go outside. So you can go straight down into the LRT and, and then head over to the newer, uh, area, have lunch and listen to conversations and do all of those things that we, that we used to do and are probably a lot of companies are going to come back to doing. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm. I'm really looking forward to seeing who wins this thing. And yeah, I'm excited. And I'll try not to fall awesome. like a baby when they give it away. Oh, he's totally going to. I, he's totally going to. Yeah, but, good. you know, some of the things that Tim was alluding to as well about the benefit of being downtown 
is there is an ecosystem downtown. And so there are other startup companies within the building that um, this business then will have the benefit of learning from and engaging with. And then as Tim said, there's, you know, there are always events and, and opportunities for collisions and conversations um, through meetups and so on. And so there's also an addition to the benefit of the space itself, but the ecosystem and the community that this company will have an opportunity to be even closer to. We'll close on that because I think that the opportunity when you talk about ecosystem is fellow leaders, fellow CEOs, fellow entrepreneurs that have a unique experience and a unique perspective that ultimately from a support perspective, you're not going to be going to your employees with some of the trials and tribulations and challenges. So your opportunity to meet somebody for lunch downtown and have that personal connection, especially as a startup, it's critical, right? Just those, those collisions and things like that, Cheryl, that you alluded to. So this is a fantastic opportunity. So I want to thank you both for coming on to this episode, but also participating in the Goodwill project. It's, uh, it's pretty exciting. Information will be left in the description closes this week at the time of recording, but the content that we've covered here over the last little while is certainly timeless. And, and as we prepare for 2022, these are all some things that, um, I think leaders will really be able to take and, uh, and at least think about when they're looking at what 2022 looks like and, and the future. Yeah. I was going to mention, um, there, there is no one size fits all there. The organizations need to having a willingness to try new things and, and recognize that maybe they need to adjust their, their, their thought, but you must, must, must engage with your staff and ask them to be honest with you. And then you can design something that will help everyone. So I don't want to, um, give the impression that because Kamala has made this choice and that that's the only choice, there's a million choices. And it depends on the organization, period. Yeah. And if I can add then, while we have the attention of uh, the leaders that are watching this podcast is what can you as an organization do to pay it forward? Tim's been an incredible inspiration. And I hope through this project, we see more companies, business owners, founders, entrepreneurs coming forward to say, what could I give to help? Because we know that COVID has created an environment that has made it so challenging for some of our small businesses in this city. And imagine then being a business that has just started out. You maybe don't have yet an established customer base. You're still trying to validate your product. There are other companies in downtown that have also made the choice like Tim has to not go back to work. Um, how do they perhaps think about doing their own goodwill project and perhaps offering up their office? And or other things, are there products, services, mentorship, advice, support that they might be able to give to this group of, of companies that are applying for this? We are going to promote who the shortlisted companies are, but there will only be one winner. So there are opportunities for other organizations maybe to wrap their arms around these other companies that don't make it and figure out what they have to give. I, I love that. And for those that are quote unquote, unsuccessful, first of all, you're successful for showing up and leaning. Yes. In, you absolutely. know, and I, I think that that's something that has, uh, has really become evident over this time is, is the tendency for us to disengage and check out anybody that's leaning in and willing to, to put the time in to do a proposal or somebody that's willing to lean in and make connections and, and lean in and engage and, and be part of the solution and not part of the problem, I think at any level should be commended and applauded. And that's the kind of mentality and the spirit moving forward that will get us through all of this stuff and anything else that comes down the pipe and not the divisiveness and the, the vitriol and all of those other things. So I think for me, that's what the Goodwill Project represents. It represents the best in people, the ability to lean in and uh, you wanna make a make a better world, you know, and, and create good businesses and and better communities and all of those other things. So from my perspective, thank you both for a coming on the episode, but also your, your, um, participation in creating the goodwill project and fingers crossed that it will, uh, it will be a great thing for somebody somewhere along the line. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks for joining.
Thank you. Thanks.